countries in, in Europe, in Israel, in North America, and the like. We're in for a treat because our speaker today is uh, a very learned scholar of his subject. I had the great pleasure of reviewing a recent book of his entitled Antisemitism and Anti-Zionism for the Journal of Contemporary Antisemitism. I learned a great deal from that book, and you will learn from what he has to say, uh, which draws on some of the material and updates it as well. In his book, um, Professor Jaspal did a, a wonderful job of qualitative research interviewing Pakistani Muslims living in the UK, as well as Iranian Muslims in Iran, uh, in order to try to understand their attitudes towards Jews, Judaism, and the state of Israel, I strongly recommend the book to anyone who would like to learn in depth about what he turned up. Uh, our speaker today uh, is a busy man. He's a professor of psychology at the University of Brighton, but in addition to that, he holds a major administrative post as Vice Chancellor for Research and Knowledge Exchange, much of his research and many of his publications to date, and they're voluminous, have been in the area of public health, public health and sexuality, in particular um, focusing on HIV and people who have uh, had to deal with those issues. But anti-Semitism has served also as a focal point of some of his most interesting work. And it's in that latter regard that we are so thrilled to have him with us today. Uh, Rusi Jaspal, I'm uh, honored to hand over now to you. We look forward to learning from you. Thank you very much indeed, Alvin, for the very generous introduction. Um, it's very, very kind of you to invite me to contribute to this seminar series. Um, I shall now just share my, my slides. Uh, if you just give me one moment, please. Great, so hopefully they'll now be visible. Excellent, great. So, um, so thank you once again, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'd also like to thank you for arranging this at a, at a mutually convenient time for, for all parties involved because 5 p.m. on a Sunday is absolutely fine by me. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as Alvin mentioned, I will be talking about, uh, largely about material that I presented in my book, which I've displayed on this slide here, Antisemitism and Anti-Zionism. And um, I'll just give a brief overview of the talk. I'd like to just begin, first of all, by telling you why I, I'm interested in antisemitism research. Now, my background as a psychologist has been on identity, the construction of identity and intergroup relations, and how people retain a sense of well-being. And um, given my own background as, as, a, as a very proud uh, Jewish person, um, but also as someone who's committed to, um, to, to positive intergroup relations and prejudice reduction, it seemed appropriate, if not necessary, actually, to apply the skills that I have in, in psychology to try to understand this really pressing problem. Um, and I have actually researched a number of different areas and different contexts of prejudice, but what's really stood out for me is the age old uh, form of prejudice, which is antisemitism, and particularly its relationship with anti Zionism. And it will be on that topic that I'll be focusing. I'll begin by defining some key constructs, because I think, you know, obviously this is an area that has been approached from so many different disciplinary perspectives using different methods. Uh, we don't always uh, mean the same thing when we talk about these concepts, it's important to define them. I'll go on to outline briefly some theories from social psychology, which I think can add um, uh, further depth to this, this very well-researched area. And as um, Alvin mentioned, my book focuses on Iranian Muslims and British Pakistani Muslims. And I really use these two case studies to explicate some of the theories. I acknowledge that this is of course, only the tip of the iceberg when we refer to anti-Semitism. There are many, many manifestations of this form of prejudice, um, but hopefully this will contribute to our understanding of the psychological motivations behind this and crucially how we might be able to address this problem. The actual empirical part of my talk will focus on three levels. 
I'm going to talk about how Jews in Israel have been represented, particularly in the press, and why this matters. I'll talk about attitudes expressed in qualitative interviews, how people think and talk about Jews in Israel, but I'll also talk about some of the quantitative survey research that I've been involved in that I didn't present in my book, which I think can help us to understand particularly how some psychological constructs like political trust, like national identity, religious identity, intersect and connect with um, anti-Semitism. But I will also talk about the limitations of the research methods. And that's one of the reasons why I like to, where possible, use both qualitative and quantitative methods. And finally, I shall present some reflections on anti-Semitism anti research, what we've learned so far, what the contribution of social psychology is and can be, and where I think we need to um, go next. So to begin with, I said I outlined some key constructs. And of course, this is a seminar series on anti-Semitism. We have a shared understanding of anti-Semitism. What I'm referring to is in line with what Fine said, a persistent latent structure of hostile beliefs towards Jews in particular. And when I talk about anti-Zionism, I'm referring to the denigration and the delegitimization of the state of Israel. That's the way that I'm referring to anti-Zionism. Of course, a lot of people may claim to be anti-Zionist, but claim also not to denigrate and delegitimize the state of Israel, but it's actually that form of uh, anti-Zionism that I am referring to. And it's worth noting that anti-Zionism is often linked to the political left, to anti-colonialism, to emancipation. People often claim that they are anti-Zionist because they are left-wing, because they are anti-colonial, and because they believe in emancipation and freedom. And some people are very proud to lay claim to an anti-Zionist identity, but I'm gonna talk about why I think that's very problematic. I wanna also be clear that criticism of the Israeli government is not anti-Zionism per se. Indeed, I myself have been critical of many elements of, um, of, the, of the Israeli government, the current one, previous ones. That is entirely plausible. But what I will also show is that this often I would say not sometimes, but it often descends into delegitimizing the state of Israel. And that is where this becomes problematic. It's worth noting also that Zionism itself um, as, as a state ideology is poorly understood. And that will come through when I present some of my qualitative interview material where people are clearly misunderstanding what, what Zionism is. And you know, a key mission I think for us as researchers, activists, um, lovers of freedom and equality is for us to challenge erroneous representations of this position. And it will be very easy to see where this occurs. And we all have a role to play in that. I'm gonna argue also that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And the question that I always pose when I'm challenged on that is, why, a, why focus on the one and only Jewish state? First of all, I'd like to outline, before I talk about my own work, some of the groundbreaking work on antisemitism that has shaped my own thinking over the years. And of course, I've tried to summarize just some of the great thinkers on one slide. Undoubtedly, I've missed out many. I've written a whole book on the topic and I summarize a lot of the work that's inspired me, but I just want to point to a few pieces of work over the years. So the work of Alvin Rosenfeld, um, has, has been greatly inspiring, um, showing how anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism have become radical, widespread, and often conflated in societal discourse. And a very key feature of both of these is the distortion of Holocaust memory and meaning, and that will come through very clearly in the data that I also present. Um, Alan Rosenfeld has also acknowledged the many ways in which anti-Semitism is manifested, and the different forms that have been well-researched European anti-Semitism in particular. Indeed, uh, the journal um, in which um, Albin's very generous review of my book was published was formally entitled the Journal of European um, Contemporary Antisemitism, recognizing that there is a real challenge on the European continent in relation to this form of prejudice. There's also new antisemitism, left-wing antisemitism in particular, and it's certainly in the United Kingdom, we've had debates about the insidious um, effects of anti-Semitism within, um, within some sections of the Labour Party, which is a, a left of centre a political party. And indeed, um, many activists and politicians within that camp have sought to, uh, to address this challenge and recognise this challenge, whilst others have not acknowledged it. 
And of course, a focus of my own research has been around Islamist antisemitism, which is also an acknowledged in Professor Rosenfeld's um, work in this area. Of course, um, Gunther has conducted a great deal of, um, of, of, of inspirational work, which certainly which preceded my own work in this area and informed my own thinking, asking questions such as how do young Muslims attempt to um, rationalize, um, pardon the typo there, rationalize their negative views of Jews in Israel, and how do they link them to geopolitical events as part of this rationale for these, for these views, to legitimize those views. Neil Kressel has um, written extensively about the religious, political and social psychological forces that have created and sustained anti-Semitism manifested in many ways, specifically within the Muslim world. Very ambitious research conducted in a context where it's very difficult to conduct this work. And I know that firsthand, of course, having researched uh, Muslim so societies myself. Florette Cohen, a fellow social psychologist, has conducted important social psychological research into uh, what she describes as modern antisemitism, highlighting in particular the significance of the terror management approach and death anxiety, arguing that when people's sense of mortality is rendered salient, they will target outgroups to restore a sense of psychological well-being. And what she's shown is that Jews and the state of Israel are often an easily accessible target. These are the other groups. And I want to understand why, why that particular group, when there are many outgroups um, that, that can be focused upon when one experiences death anxiety and mortality salience. And of course, Stephen Baum, a, 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 a long-standing researcher in this area, again, a fellow psychologist approaching this topic from a clinical psychological perspective. One of the many studies he's conducted that stands out for me is his research into superstitious beliefs and the association with antisemitism. He finds a significant correlation between these, and he argues that culture is absolutely key. And indeed, that's something that permeates my own research. So just a whistle-stop tour, just a, a handful of the scholars who've inspired me in my own journey in this area. Now, of course, I must say, as Alvin mentioned, I've, I've researched many different topics, and antisemitism is one that's close to my heart not least for the reasons I outlined, but also because of my own identity. Um, and I've, I, I seek to contribute to this area, to learn from my fellow um, researchers in this area and to see how we can bridge our approaches to pr produce something really impactful. And that's what I hope to share with you today. Moving on, I'd like to talk a little bit about the theories from social psychology that I've used to, uh, to guide my approach and to, um, to, to, to conduct my research. And really what I've sought to do is to link three levels, representations that exist in our society, individual level thinking, our emotions and our behaviors, and the group memberships that we are a part of. And I'll begin with social representations. I draw upon a theory in psychology known as social representations theory. It argues that we are bombarded with different versions of reality, disseminated by different stakeholders in different fora. These versions are created, these versions of reality are created through two processes. We anchor novelty to what we already know about. We anchor new things to things that already exist within our society. And an example of this would be how, for instance, the Palestinian uh, cause is sometimes anchored to the Holocaust. It's sometimes linked to the Holocaust. It's, all, it's sometimes represented as being the Palestinian Holocaust. And that will come through quite powerfully in the data that I present to you. So it provides a lens for thinking about novelty. Also objectification is another approach that's used. This is where, where abstract ideas are presented in tangible ways, through metaphors, through personification, through visual images. These can be very powerful ways of creating representations because people are left with a concrete image in, in their mind of things that they may not know an awful lot about. Things are talked about in the press, for example. The second theory that's shaped my thinking is intergroup threat theory. This argues that we are told and we sometimes come to believe that our valued group memberships are threatened. And they're often threatened by mysterious outgroups with which we may have very limited or no contact whatsoever. Of course, one outgroup uh, for, for many non-Jews is the Jewish people. One outgroup for the international community is the state of Israel. And the threats that can be constructed and ca that can be described are either realistic, 
in, in, in inverted commas, and this refers to threats of physical harm or economic harm, you know, the idea that Israel is an aggressor, that the Jewish people begin wars and conflicts, or that they try to usurp the economic um, uh, uh, and assets of other countries and other peoples, or they can be positioned as posing a symbolic threat, a threat to culture, a threat to the political systems, destabilizing political systems. And what I've argued in my work is that some groups can be hyper-threatening. That is when they are positioned as posing both symbolic and realistic threats. I would argue that in many cases, the state of Israel and the Jewish people are represented as posing these hybrid threats that are both realistic and symbolic. And that comes across powerfully in the print media. A theory that I've been writing about for many years at an individual level is identity process theory. And that argues that we as individuals will seek levels of self-esteem, a sense of continuity over time, a sense of positive distinctiveness from others, including from other groups, and a sense of self-efficacy, so control and competence. These are essentially human needs in the theory. And the key thing is that some representations like the ones I just use as examples, can challenge these feelings. They can make us feel um, less self-efficacious. They can challenge our sense of continuity. They can make us feel less positively, positively distinctive. And the theory argues that when these principles are curtailed, that we experience identity threat. And in response to that, we'll try and cope. Now, there are many, many coping strategies that we use as human beings when, when exposed to threat, but one particular one that has a close alignment with um, our understanding of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is outgroup derogation, delegitimization and conflict. Some people react to threat by derogating outgroups, by delegitimizing them and by engaging in conflict. We call that the us versus them dynamic. And of course, this dynamic can restore for some people these feelings of self-esteem, continuity, and, and positive distinctiveness, and self-efficacy, and I'll show how in some of the interview material. They can help to sustain and nurture anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in some groups and societies. Just before this webinar, Gunther and I were talking about how our field presents really valuable descriptive work on anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. We know how many incidents there are, um, acts of this occurring, that's important. But what we also need to try and understand is why does this persist? Why does it carry on? And, and hopefully this theory can help contribute to our understanding of that very issue. As um, Alvin mentioned at the beginning, my work focuses on two case studies. Iranian anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism. I want to just present a rationale for why I chose to focus on this. Now, there are some societies in which anti-Zionism and arguably anti-Semitism are ideological building blocks of the political system. The Islamic Republic of Iran is one such context. Since 1979, when the revolution occurred, and it's important to bear in mind that prior to this, Israel and uh, the imperial state of Iran enjoyed diplomatic relations. Iran's clerics and politicians have consistently denounced Israel. They don't even refer to it as, as Israel. They refer to it as the Zionist regime, the Zionist entity in many other pejorative terms. They question its legitimacy as an independent state. They repeatedly call for its destruction. While doing so, they often derogate, denigrate Jews. They hold hostage the Jewish people, the sizable Jewish minority that live within the borders of Iran. As I mentioned, they, there's an interchangeable use of the categories Jew and, and Zionism in political discourse. And um, overtly, um, the, the regime, the Iranian regime, blatantly denies the Holocaust. And I will show examples of how that happens and still happens to this day. Iran presents also a unique demographic situation because it, as I mentioned, constitutes the Muslim community, uh, country with the largest Jewish minority population. Now, personally, I think that the Jewish minority is one to be nurtured because it is one of the last remaining um, original Jewish communities in a, a, a Middle Eastern country outside of Israel. But as I mentioned, they are often held hostage symbolically. Um, and I talk in the paper that I, that I cite just at the bottom of this slide 
about how uh, J Jews who are living in Iran struggle to retain a sense of Jewish identity, a very proud Jewish identity, whilst also retaining a strong Iranian national identity. Um, and the, the challenges of that face when facing this ideology of official anti-Zionism that's entwined with anti-Semitism. I also use in my research a case study of um, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism among, among British Pakistani Muslims. And um, re the reasons for this is that I think it's very important to also focus on pockets of society and, and subgroups within societies, Western societies, where there remains a great deal of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. That's sometimes not researched because of sensitivities, political sensitivities, social sensitivities. I present some demographic features on this slide that I won't go through, but I just want to mention one thing that it's important to bear in mind that some minorities in Western societies feel disenfranchised. They feel marginalized and excluded from the mainstream political systems. They feel that they cannot trust the media. And Sari in 2005 notes, and I think this is still relevant, that Muslim suffering and grievances elsewhere are deeply felt by Muslims in Britain. And they influence their attitudes vis-a-vis -vis key issues, I would argue also vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli-Arab conflict. They may also express a hesitation about consuming Western media, believing it to be um, uh, uh, erroneous, false. They may believe in conspiracy theories. Therefore, they may turn to, turn to uh, other media outlets, such as those that I will review in some of the research that I'll present. So first of all, a whistle-stop tour of my research into social representations of Jews and Israel. And I'd like you to be mindful of some of the theories I've presented um, whilst listening to this part of my presentation. This is quite a busy slide. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I want to make this available to attendees so that you can, um, you, you can discover more about this line of research if you are interested and indeed consult the original sources. But I conducted several years ago, an in-depth analysis of news reporting in the Iranian, um, two Iranian outlets. One is the Tehran Times and the other is Press TV. I analyzed media representations in both the English language intended for an international audience, such as those who feel um, disenfranchised, those who don't trust the Western media, but also the Persian language media intended for a domestic audience. The representations were very similar in qualitative content, and I will just outline three of the main themes. There was a theme, first of all, around resisting representations of Israeli statehood. That was rejected entirely. It was rejected by using terms like the Zionist regime, the Tel Aviv regime, the Hebrew regime, occupied Palestine, and referring to the Zionists when actually referring to the Israeli government. This served two purposes, one to delegitimize the state entirely, to crystallize this type of terminology in people's thinking and talk about this, and indeed it surfaces in some of the interviews I'll present, but also it conflates government and citizens. Everybody is, is deemed to be a Zionist with no differentiation of publics and governments. And there was some very dramatic, and I would argue dangerous terminology used constructing threat the regime as a cancerous tumor that will metastasize if even a part of it re remains on Palestinian soil. This idea that this is Palestine, it's not Israel. Needless to say, there was a great deal of, of uh, outgroup threat terminology used. These are just some extracts from some newspapers to give you a flavor of the type of very consistent representation. In reference to the trial of, of Ali Jamali um, Fashi, who was um, accused of assassinating um, a nuclear physicist in Iran. It was argued that the trial would shed light on the Zionist regime's involvement in terrorist attacks against the Iranian people. So this idea that there is, no, there is not a targeted attack um, in line with the interests of the state of Israel, but rather on the Iranian people itself. So it's being Israel or the regime in, in the terminology of, um, of the Iranian press is represented as a threat to the Iranian people. And there's a linking of the regime to terrorism and particularly to the so-called um, US-Israel axis of terrorism in the world, really uh, to anchor this to the notion of the axis of evil that was used also um, in, in the United States and elsewhere. An interesting thing also was how anti-Zionism was being constructed consistently as a religious duty 
for Muslims to construct this Muslim Ummah, this Muslim brotherhood and community across the world. And here are some examples of that. The liberation of Palestine could serve as the unifying point of Islamic awakening movements in different countries and could restore the rights um, which have been downtrodden by the Zionist regime. Constructing Palestine as the main issue of the Islamic world and referring to Israel, of course, never referred to as Israel, as the common enemy of all Muslims. So there's a sense that to be a real Muslim, you have to be anti-Zionist. That's the representation that's being disseminated. Now, another case study that I um, wanted to analyze was uh, the Holocaust cartoon competition, which was a government sponsored competition, inviting artists from around the world to submit their cartoons, their artwork, with the express purpose of representing the Holocaust. So this was Holocaust denial in artistic form, espoused, sponsored by the Iranian regime, and internationalized. So I analyzed that to see what the cartoons were, what the representations were across them, and what the winning entries were. So what it took to win this competition. And here are some, um, some of the main themes across the analysis of all of the cartoons from 2006. And here are just some examples at the bottom of this slide to show you the, just how disgusting this, these images actually were, but how they were celebrated by the Iranian government. There was a consistent theme of constructing the evil Jew and brutal Israel often juxtaposed. And this is of course demonstrated in some of the examples that I've presented. Denial of the Holocaust, particularly clear in the second image that I've presented and the affirmation of Palestinian suffering. So there were many images where, for instance, there was a Palestinian represented as being within a Nazi concentration camp. The construction of international subservience to the so-called Nazi um, Zionist and, and often US Zionist ideology that was being presented. And this is exemplified by the third image. Now, of course, I could fill my entire PowerPoint presentation with the images and they still wouldn't fit because there were so many of them. There was a winner, a runner up, and there were many who were commended for their work. I reiterate, sponsored by the Iranian government, exported to the world. Now that's about the representations that people that are out there for people to consume, that are out there to influence the way that people are thinking. And I want to briefly talk about some of the interview material that I have collected over the years, presented in my book. And again, a busy slide, but I just want to point to three, uh, four themes that emerged from a qualitative interview study that my research assistant conducted with 40 Iranian men and women um, about their attitudes towards Israel's and Jews. Now we have to bear in mind that this is a dangerous topic to study when you are in the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's because there is a lot of conspiracy theorizing. People may be represented and even imprisoned for spying when with a sh not a shred of evidence actually to back that up. So it's a risky context to actually study. And we tried to do this um, in, in, in a way that was um, that was uh, to the highest ethical standards, safeguarding researcher safety, but it was a real challenge. So I think that despite the small sample size of this, um, it's an area of work that I, that I, I feel particularly uh, pleased about because it sheds light on a hitherto under-researched, dare I say, unresearched uh, topic, not with this, with this sort of empirical material. Now, the themes are as follows. There was a very close relationship in participants' talk between anti-Zionism and Iranian national identity. The two were seen as being closely entwined. And this is clear in this extract from, a, from Ismail, a pseudonym, a male self-identified hardliner in Iran. Israel is the opposite of Iran. It's everything that we are not, and we are everything that they are not, you know? They're a different kind of people. So it's that juxtaposition of being Israeli and being Iranian. And um, you'll see how being anti-Zionist is represented as being part of being Iranian. Elham, a, a female self-identified reformist, said, I have no problem with them referring to Jews, but they're not really Iranians, are they? Referring, of course, to Iranian Jews. They're not true Iranians. Their faith is somewhere else. Their loyalty is somewhere else. So this is positioning Jews to the in-group. The idea being that the in-group, true Iranians, are not Jews. They're being positioned outside of this category. And I mentioned earlier on that Iranian identity is important to many 
uh, Jews in Iran, that's probably one of the reasons why they remain in that country, despite the hostile context in which they reside. There was also an elaboration of anti-Semitic representations, a very sometimes linking um, anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism. So look at this extract here. Um, Saeed says, many Jews died in the Holocaust, but many Muslims have also died. Many Iranians died in the imposed war, referring to the Iran-Iraq war. Many Muslims are being killed in Afghanistan, Iraq. I don't understand the focus on Jews. So it's this attempt to delegitimize the Holocaust, to reduce the severity of that act of annihilation, attempted annihilation of the Jewish people, to downgrade it by anchoring, by linking it to things that are going on um, within the Muslim community. So again, a clear example of anti-Semitism in my, in my view. And there was also a great deal of Holocaust revisionism. Now, the Holocaust uh, cartoon competition and many other initiatives, anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist initiatives by the Iranian regime were of course, uh, spearheaded by Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, a hardliner. And one self-identified reformist, remember, these are people who rejected Ahmadinejad or claimed to do so, indicated, I hate Ahmadinejad, I didn't vote for him, I never wanted him, but he, he did one, he, one thing he did do, and it's courageous, he said to the world, let's talk about the Holocaust. If Jews have nothing to hide, why hide it? Why do they say, no, we can't discuss this? Jews in America say it, the Zionists say it. So there's this idea that despite the flaws of uh, the hardliners in Iran, one thing they did get right was Holocaust revisionism, denying it, revisiting it, re redefining what this meant, redefining history, despite the wealth of evidence that we of course have about the veracity of this historically demonstrated event in history. Despite that, there is a desire to, to revise this. And of course, this is music to some people's ears when actually they um, themselves have inclinations to, to believe in conspiracy theorizing, which psychologists have been explaining for many years, can arise from threat, from a, a, a perception that your group is somehow threatened, marginalized, so on and so forth. So it can be very readily adopted by some people. Now, some of the qualitative material among British Pakistanis. I interviewed a few years later, 36 British Pakistani men and women about their attitudes towards Israel and Jews. And there were similar themes that were being represented. And I think for me, this is one of the reasons why I juxtaposed the two case studies into a single book to demonstrate that as my title suggests, there's a changing faces or different manifestations. But if you look beneath the bonnet, if you look carefully at what's actually underpinning this, there's a very similar discourse. In seeking to make sense of Zionism, many of the participants refer to this as an evil ideology, defining it as the philosophy of evil, referring to the heartache in the world, everything that's gone wrong, to Zionism. Now, I mentioned at the beginning these erroneous representations of what Zionism means. Many people in, in, that I interviewed were equating Zionism with Nazism. They came to understand the right of the Jewish people to nationhood, to, their, to the one and only state in the world, to lay claim to this one and only state as arising from an abhorrent ideology. And there was a, a shared desire to defeat the state of Israel, albeit in different ways. Many refer to the Arab Spring. Now I mentioned in my previous set of interviews that the Islamic awakening, that was a reference to the Arab Spring, well, here, Sabah, a female, refers to the Arab Spring as about taking control and Muslims taking control, getting their land back, control of it, and Israel being the loser in this attempt. So it's reconstruing what's going on, geopolitical events, in a way that signals Israel's end, its demise. There were, well, we saw less of this among the Iranian participants, but there were attempts to deflect anti-Semitism. That's to be expected in societies where there is very clear legislation against um, ethnic and religious discrimination, where these are protected characteristics in our society. People don't always feel comfortable being very overt about their anti-Semitism. People often start their sentences with, I have nothing against Jews, but, and when I hear the but, it often sin signals 
that something anti-Semitic is about to come. We call that in psychology a discursive disclaimer. You know, you see that with many forms of prejudice. People often say, I'm not sexist, but and then they'll make a sexist, a sexist remark, you know. And that's exactly what we see in this context. People referring to having Jewish friends, but knowing Judaism and referring to Jews as their cousins, but referring to Zionism as a, a flawed ideology, as a fake state, and not recognizing the Jewish people's right to nationhood not recognizing that right. And it brings us back to what the, the point I made at the very beginning about, for me, anti-Zionism equaling anti-Semitism when defined in the way in which I define it. And also carving a space in the Islamic Ummah. Now you'll, you'll recall that I've mentioned this in relation to the representations. The media representations were talking about the duty of Muslims to fight Israel, and dare I also add, in some cases, also to oppose Jews when they assert their right to nationhood. And one participant sa said, um, it's a cause that us Muslims are all passionate about anti-Zionism. We believe in it strongly and it brings us together, you know, it's common ground, all the divisions are broken down, that feels good. Now, the context of this, of course, is that Islam, like many other religions, like Judaism, like Christianity has many denominations, many schools of thought, many different cultural manifestations, that gives rise to some people not feeling part of a global community, but it was often claimed that this was one agenda that, they, that everybody could get behind in order to assert a common sense of belonging. And of course, belonging is important for people. We all seek feelings of belonging. It's part of deriving a sense of self-esteem, of deriving a sense of continuity over time, feeling part of a community that predates us as human beings that we can all lay claim to in history. Now, the final part of my presentation before I end is around the quantitative data that I don't present in my book. And it's based on a survey that I managed to conduct in Iran with 130 participants. Now, ordinarily, I would see this as a very small sample size. We should, of course, view these results with caution. But it's very difficult to conduct this kind of research in Iran, as I mentioned, next to impossible. And an Iranian research assistant was able to recruit a participant sample with the following characteristics. It occurred in three districts in Tehran, in the, the capital, an affluent district, a, what, what it may, be, may be described as a lower middle class district and an economically deprived one. So hopefully we were able to get a fairly even breakdown in terms of socioeconomic background, bearing in mind the small sample size. The mean age was 27.8 years, and the standard deviation was eight years. So this is a relatively young sample. So it, it doesn't tell us an awful lot about older people. I think this is a crucial point because, of course, people who perhaps remember relations pre-1979 may have a different view. We don't know. We only have a relatively young sample here. It's heavily skewed towards males. That could have something to do with where participants were recruited. It was largely in cafeterias, um, in, in uh, outside of online contexts. The majority were born in, Iran, in Tehran, but there were also some people living in Tehran who were born elsewhere in the country. And 46% of people described themselves as political conservatives or hardliners, people that might ordinarily support uh, politicians like Ahmadinejad, and 54% um, describe themselves as reformists. Now, again, I don't want to labor the point, but I reiterate small sample size, but it enabled us to conduct some statist statistical analyses I will just briefly outline now, very briefly. But here's the paper that I've just uh, referenced, which you're welcome to, to read, published in Contemporary Jewry. But the first thing to note is that here are the main variables that I measured in the study. I measured people's level of Iranian national identity. How identified are they with the Iranian na nation? Um, I measured their Muslim religion, um, their sense of connection with Muslim religion, that the strength of their religious identity, their political trust, their trust in the Iranian political system and in politicians, their level of anti-Semitism, their level of anti-Zionism, and also their feelings of identity threat. You'll recall at the beginning, I talked about when people feel low levels of self-esteem, self-efficacy, continuity, and positive distinctiveness, that's what we refer to as threat. Now, the key thing is all of these variables were measured on an eight point scale. So the means are out of eight. Overall, you can see, if we look at anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, pretty high. 
5.34 with anti-Semitism and 5.78 with anti-Zionism, pretty high levels. We would ordinarily expect when I conduct surveys in the UK, we tend to see a mean of say two or a mean of you know 2.5. That, that's what we're talking about. But here we, we're looking, we're seeing it at the other end of the scale. And the other point is that anti-Zionism is slightly higher, but also we see relatively high levels of nationhood and religion. So people are quite identified with the Iranian nationhood and with religion to be expected when it's a, a society that's quite isolated. It's a society that perceives itself to be threatened, that perceives many threats. When you feel threatened, you become more identified with your group. You know, that's, that's something that we, we know in, in social psychology. Now here are a few multiple regression models, just very briefly, and I'd like us to focus on model four, that's on the far um, right hand side of the screen. And I put into the model these four variables to predict anti-Semitism. What are the factors that are most associated with anti-Semitism when they're put together into a model? What is the fit of the, of the, the data to the model? And um, what is the respective importance of each of these variables, each of these factors? And I mentioned, I've talked about the, the three already. As we can see here, and we're looking at a higher beta score in, under model four, we can see that political trust is the strongest predictor of anti-Semitism. So the more people trust the political system, the more anti-Semitic they are. The second most important one, is identity threat. The more threatened people feel generally, the more likely it is that they're going to, the higher their level of anti-Semitism is going to be, which supports this hypothesis that they are threatened and they may be coping by expressing anti-Semitism. That connects with um, Florette Cohen's work also around this terror management theory idea that when we feel threatened, albeit in a different way, we look for convenient outgroups to denigrate, delegitimize. And the third one is also Muslim identification. The more identified people are with their religion, the more anti-Semitic they are. How might we explain this? Well, what is the government saying in Iran? It's very clear what the government's saying. It's very clear what's being represented in the media and so on. So look at the content of what they're saying. People may be manifesting um, a threat, uh, they're coping by, uh, in response to threat. And finally, what are the perceived norms in the version of religion that is being disseminated and promoted in Iran? Now, Neil Kressel, other colleagues in this area have talked about the actual um, content of representations in the religious sphere, how theology can be presented in such a way to be anti-Semitic. Although, um, of course, a lot of this may be open to interpretation. It's about what's emphasized in places of worship and so on. So, Final slide, and then I will end some reflections. Antisemitism is a global challenge. We know that. It's unlike any form of prejudice. It stood the test of time. It's manifested in so many different ways. We need to study it using different methods, different approaches. Geopolitical change is occurring. Now, I conduct, conducted this research when Iran could present itself as being the leader of this agenda. But of course, things have changed since. Since we've seen since then, we've seen the establishment of diplomatic relations with other Muslim majority countries in the Muslim um, world with the state of Israel. This may be changing things. Um, there's also massive social change that's occurring. People are becoming more educated. People are also leaving their countries. They are encountering other Jewish people firsthand. They are encountering also web representations that can in sometimes con contrast with the ideas that their governments are telling them. There's an emergence of novel threats. Political trust is waning. People are seeing that their governments aren't being honest with them in these societies. They may be questioning, and indeed they are questioning, why is Iran supporting Hezbollah in Lebanon bombing the north of Israel when there are so many economic problems in our own country? That's the questions people are asking. People are asking why they should be funding Hamas when actually there are problems domestic, domestic in, 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 on a domestic level. So political trust is waning. Maybe this provides opportunities. But at the same hand, on the same level, there are subtle manifestations of anti-Semitism that are emerging. I touched on some of them. Now, I said also that I touch on the methodological issues in anti-Semitism research. It's a complex area. I'm not satisfied with doing quantitative research exclusively. I've tried it. I've tried it in the United Kingdom. I have often not found 
um, uh, significant results that 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 link in with my qualitative data. Why? It may be difficult when there is a real social desirability bias. People may not be willing or even conscious of their own anti-Semitism when it exists. We need to refine our methods. We need to use cognitive methods that go beyond direct questions about, do you believe that Jews are evil? Which are the sorts of questions that we've relied upon asking in previous anti-Semitism research. Now, how do we move forward? Threat seems to be important here. People are talking about how they feel their groups are threatened. How can we support people to manage their feelings of threat? How can we facilitate coping that doesn't rely on denigrating outgroups? I don't have the answers to these questions, but I think these are questions we need to be as policymakers grappling with. We need to be deriving interventions that can really address these questions. How can we continue to expose and challenge political uses of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism where they arise. Now, some people feel uneasy about doing that when it, when it occurs in minority groups who themselves may be marginalized. It's important to recognize this, to identify it and fight it because no form of prejudice is acceptable. It, we can't pick and choose which groups are more acceptable targets of prejudice. When Islamophobia occurs, I will be the first person to call that out and I'll be the first person to challenge it. But we must also do the same with anti-Semitism where it occurs. Addressing the two is not incompatible. Indeed, they are compatible for anyone who loves freedom. And I would like to finally end by thanking wholeheartedly from the bottom of my heart, the Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's delightful to be able to present this. I will stop sharing my slides now. Thank you.